Hey everybody, so today we get to discuss a uh, Letter from Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King. Uh, honestly, this is one of my favorite articles that we get to do over the entire semester. Um, I really love this article for uh, so many reasons. Uh, in such a short, compact letter, uh, MLK packs so much philosophy, um, sociology, history, tradition, uh, advice on how to solve some of these things. It's really astounding how on point MLK is with so many things and how concisely how concisely he fits it all into this letter uh, that he writes to these clergy members, as we'll discuss. Um, so if you haven't read a letter from Birmingham jail before, uh, I'm sure that you've heard of it. Um, and I really hope that you enjoyed reading through it. If you've already read letter from Birmingham jail, I hope that you enjoyed reading through it again, especially after we've discussed certain stuff throughout the semester. Uh, I imagine that when we discuss concepts of like autonomy and personhood equality, all of these things that we've hit, up, uh, hit upon and we go through what MLK is saying, that they resound just a little bit more. Uh, it becomes more clear what sort of things he's talking about and the language he's using to sort of assert these problems um, and how he thinks is the best sort of solution to move forward with solving them. So first we need to talk about sort of the setup. Um, you know, why is MLK in jail? Uh, why is he writing this letter? What is, why is this letter, um, you know, uh, addressed to these clergymen? So he was protesting in Birmingham, uh, Alabama in 1963, and he was arrested uh, for protesting. Now, that's actually not even all of the story. Uh, the story sort of of exactly how these protesters um, MLK uh, specifically, but more generally, black populations in America at the time who decided to uh, protest, what uh, sort of nefarious and uphill battles they often had to fight. So protesting is something that is protected in America. Uh, you are allowed to do it. So obviously they couldn't just arrest him for protesting per se. So what basically uh, people in these areas would do was find out where the protest was going to be and then they would come up with sort of like zoning restrictions uh, so when the protester uh, protesters showed up they would have a separate reason to arrest them so it wasn't that they were protesting it was that they were protesting on a restricted area uh, but that area would have only been restricted uh, you know within a day or two before the protest started and the simple and the only reason that they would do that would be to try to stop the protest and be able to arrest those people. Uh, so these are just the constant battles that MLK had to fight. He's in jail for doing something that every American has the right to do. How did they get away with it? By arresting him for something slightly different, uh, protesting in a restricted zone, uh, making him sort of seem like he was, um, you know, criminally negligent. He's just showing up to these areas that he shouldn't be in and protesting. Uh, but they were constantly trying to check and make sure that they were avoiding any sort of problems like that, but every once in a while they'd run into it, and this was one of those instances. So MLK decides to uh, write a letter to some clergymen in Alabama um, who had basically spoken negatively of his cause and uh, of him specifically being there to sort of rile up the masses and cause this racial tension within Birmingham. Um, and obviously MLK is going to feel very different about the cause of why that's occurring. Uh, and he's going to address that. And that's why he addresses the clergy in Alabama specifically. That is who he is talking to. Uh, these clergymen who'd come out and written against his cause. So he has to answer, why is he in Birmingham? He's not from Birmingham. He's not, you know, he doesn't live there. He's not a resident. He came to Birmingham specifically to be part of this uh, protest group uh, for the black Americans uh, in that area. And he's going to say, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Uh, so I am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. Uh, this is a very integral part. Obviously, we know that uh, MLK was a, a very religious man, but that's also very fundamental to who he was and sort of how he, uh, you know, what he felt he was obligated to do. Uh, this idea of carrying the gospel, uh, you know, everywhere, that's very Christian. That is part of, you know, uh, after Jesus's death, carrying that gospel throughout the Holy Lands. Um, 
they had to carry that to people. They had to take that to them. And MLK, obviously, you know, he's not saying he's Jesus, anything like that. I'm just pointing out, you know, his Christian faith definitely gave him a direction that you need to go to these places and help resolve these injustices. You can't just say, you know, oh, I'm not from that town. It's not my problem. Uh, no, if you believe in sort of this objective standard of uh, ethical behavior and sin and these sort of things, you can't just sit back because because you're safe, you need to go to the people, uh, bring them the message and help solve the problem. Um, and he's not going to believe sort of in this idea of the internal communities. He's going to feel that, you know, um, anywhere in America, there's an injustice. We need to solve that. You can't just say, you know, I'm a Texan. I don't need to worry about what happens in uh, Louisiana. No, if there's injustice occurring there, we as Americans should care and try to stop that uh, and try to limit any of those uh, racial problems. So this is uh, basically a statement, uh, feel free to read through it, um, but basically uh, MLK is going to say, you are focusing on the wrong cause if you think I'm the one causing racial tension, uh, if you think I'm the problem. Um, what you really should be asking yourself is what would inspire an entire community of people to get up and protest. Uh, it's not going to be something simple. It's not going to be something meaningless. If that many people are that it, sort of uh, involved in changing this, really what you should be asking is what is the problem they're trying to respond to? Um, instead of saying they themselves are the problem, you're looking at the wrong, um, you know, you're looking, looking at the wrong causal agent here and you need to take a step back uh, and make sure that you're sort of blaming the, uh, you know, blaming the proper groups for their uh, transgressions and holding up the groups that are doing the right thing. So we know MLK uh, predominantly through his nonviolent campaigns, um, you know, the marches, the sit-ins. These were trying to, you know, very much part of who MLK was as a person and part of his social movement and part of his idea of how we could change the system uh, and how we can improve that system without resorting to violence, which is, again, to his Christian ideology, something that he wants to avoid. Uh, Jesus was very about nonviolence. Uh, you know, he never took up the sword or, you know, the gun and went out and fought for that. That wasn't his way of doing it. And MLK is trying to replicate that kind of Christian message that we can improve, we can progress, we don't need to do it through violence. We can do it through nonviolent action that gets people's attention and gets them to the table to talk. So the four steps in his nonviolent action campaigns, uh, one, collection of the facts that determine whether injustice exists. So don't just believe, uh, you know, hearsay, uh, go get the facts. Um, don't believe, you know, in 2018, don't just believe a 2018 Facebook post or a meme. Go get the facts. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, edited videos online. Uh, there's a lot of videos that don't tell, you know, the story behind it. Um, make sure that you're getting all of the facts. Now, once you get those facts, it can absolutely verify what your initial thought was, but make sure that you're getting them all because they're very well, there very may well be information uh, that would make you change your position on what is occurring. Negotiation is going to be the second step, and it's always going to be the second step. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second, but you collect the facts and then you try to negotiate. That is always going to be your next step after you verify that there is a, uh, a problem. And then self-purification, I'll discuss what that is in uh, a few more slides, but the idea being simply um, be prepared for what you're about to face and know that you're a good enough person and a calm enough person not to react in a way that's gonna be detrimental. And then finally, direct action. Uh, so again, this uh, direct action is nonviolent, but it's something that's public. It's something that is um, meant to rile people up. It's something that's meant to get attention, but it is not meant to be violent uh, in any way. So as I said, the uh, second step is always going to be negotiation. Um, you know, once you found that that injustice uh, is in fact occurring, MLK was not, um, you know, he wasn't dumb. He understood negotiation was not going to work. 
a vast amount of the time. He didn't think that, you know, um, you negotiate because it's the uh, most successful way to get there necessarily. Uh, it wasn't that he felt that negotiation was, you know, what was always going to provide the answer. Uh, it was actually much more than that. So it wasn't that it was always going to be effective, but it was always necessary to do first. Um, and there's lots of reasons for this, um, both sort of socially, uh, again, back to sort of his moral beliefs of nonviolence, the fact that we should be able to talk these things out. But really, one of the main reasons is almost psychological. Um, if you air your grievances and try to talk about them and somebody shuts you down, you now have cause to move to the next step. You now have cause to take that direct action. You have tried to present your problem. They weren't willing to listen. Uh, you tried to uh, implement solutions. They didn't want to go through with that. But once you've done that and they have denied you, you now have a much stronger justification for why you're marching through the streets, for why you're doing this sit-in. Because when you went to them and said, we need to desegregate the lunch counter, they said no. Uh, when you went to them and said, we need to desegregate the schools, they said no. So now you are having to take this next action. So um, thinking of it uh, if this wasn't the next step let's say you find this injustice and then you say you know tomorrow we're all going to meet we're all going to go to city hall and we're going to protest well if those people at city hall haven't heard exactly why you're protesting um one they're probably not going to take you as seriously because you haven't tried to talk to them uh and two they might get defensive um this happens with us all the time it's a natural reaction when somebody tries to uh, attack you for something you try to get defensive about it especially if you're unsure about sort of what it is you don't feel like you have all the facts um you're just going to try to dismiss it and defend yourself against it and you'll likely take that stance even further when you have to defend it uh, instead of uh, being open-minded and objective when they do present those problems. Um, so think of it maybe like if, you know, this is obviously a, a much simpler example than the racial inequalities that were occurring in America in 1960. But imagine you're at work um, and a coworker has a problem with you and instead of coming to you first, they go to the boss. Well, if they go to the boss and don't come talk to you, you're probably not going to be super open about listening to their problem and trying to uh, resolve it. Uh, you're probably going to get defensive. Uh, no, you know, I, I don't play my music too loud. She's just always complaining or whatever it, whatever it is. You just get sort of defensive about it instead of uh, if they had come to you and said, hey, like, you know, would you mind turning your music down just a couple of notches? Uh, I can hear it in my office and I'm trying to make some phone calls completely reasonable. Uh, whereas if they go to the boss and they say, you know, um, Blake's in there blasting his music and I can't make calls, customers are hanging up, like blah, blah, blah. I'm going to get defensive when the boss comes to me and says, are you blasting music in your office? Uh, so again, it's that sort of psychological ploy. Uh, hopefully in talking to them, they'll be open-minded and want to work with you. But if they don't, if we go back to the coworker, if they come and they ask and I don't want to turn my music down, well, now they have every justification to go to the boss. And when the boss comes to me, I can't say, well, you know, she never asked me to turn it down. No, she did. I know what I did. I told her I didn't care. And now I'm facing the consequences for that. So it's a justification to jump to that next step. The self-purification, um, uh, it's community organizing for that direct action. And as I said earlier, it's about preparing preparing people for that direct uh, direct action. So they would be uh, workshops and nonviolence, and they would have to uh, work on answering questions like, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? And they had to answer them honestly. You had to be ready to do these things. And this is really one of the most central aspects of uh, MLK's nonviolent campaigns. One of the things that made them so successful is that he really prepared the community to go out there and avoid detrimental coverage of their protest. So are you able to accept blows without retaliating? You know, if, if somebody comes up and starts beating me up, I should be able to defend myself, right? What is MLK saying? I should lay on the floor and just take a beating? Yes. That is exactly what he is saying you should do. If somebody rushes out of the crowd and starts fighting you, 
Do not fight them back. If cops come over and start roughing you up uh, to arrest you, put your hands behind your back. Let them arrest you. Let them take you. If they take you to jail and start booking you, don't go crazy. Let them take your fingerprints. Let them book you. Just be cool. Now, again, when you're talking about all of the oppression and inequality that's occurred over centuries, it's really difficult to imagine telling somebody that this oppressor, basically, you should just lay down and allow them to do whatever they want. But it, it's, again, in a psychological aspect, much more complicated than that. And we have to look at the context of the culture at that time. There's going to be news coverage at these protests. If somebody comes out of the, you know, comes out of the, uh, you know, out of an alley and starts beating up some of the black protesters, and then a bunch of other black protesters rush in and start beating up that guy, what will be the coverage on the paper the next day? White man rushes into crowd and sucker punches black man, you know, uh, other, you know, black protesters come to the rescue. That's unlikely going to be the headline. The headline the next day will be, you know, protests got violent as fight breaks out. And they'll post pictures of the fight, which will look like a bunch of uh, black protesters beating up a white person. Everything was being skewed. Everything was propaganda. Everything was against them. You had to be perfect. Otherwise, your message would be, uh, you know, would be thrown off. And a great example of this that actually just very recently occurred uh, about two or three years ago, I believe, was the uh, Baltimore, um, Baltimore protest over Black Lives Matter. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people marched through Baltimore completely peacefully i'm tens of thousands of people marched through baltimore peacefully all anybody talked about or remembered for the next two weeks was a few dozen people maybe a hundred people who decided to cause uh havoc and burn down a cvs and start destroying certain buildings um those people became the image for the baltimore protests and completely distracted from everything that the you know 10 20 30 thousand people marching earlier that day had gone out and tried to get attention for they had tried to come out and argue for you know um this look into uh police brutality and the inequality of uh young black males killed by the police and at the end of the day again the only focus was on the violence that had occurred that day uh and because many of them were black youth at the time it was really throughout the news world covered as something that was detrimental to the idea of uh black youth being treated unfairly um and you know again we see these images and we don't want to believe that we're affected by them but at the end of the day uh, what message was consistently being um, reviewed throughout the weeks? What what was the thing that we kept coming back to? Was that image of the burning CVS, not the image of 30,000 people fighting for a better judicial system, a better uh, policing system, all of these things. So it's very important that none of those detrimental images or actions occur Otherwise, that's what people will run with. That's a much more sensational news story, and that's what will get coverage. And um, MLK knew that. So that's why he prepared the community so effectively uh, and so extensively before they would go out and practice their nonviolent uh, actions. And then finally, direct action. So, you know, you, you've you tried to sit down at the table, you've tried to negotiate, uh, you didn't get anything. You brought the community together, you prepared everybody, you made sure that they understood it needed to stay nonviolent, that they needed to uh, passively accept the aggressive things that were likely going to happen to them. And now it comes time for the direct action. But this isn't something, um, again, if we think about how much preparation goes into it, it's not like, you know, gather up all of your friends, meet here at City Hall tomorrow with your signs, we're going to protest. Uh, these things were planned far more in advance and far more extensively. So they would be planned far ahead of time uh, to make sure that there were no conflicts. He talks about avoiding conflicts with things like elections, um, 
um, they do utilize holidays. Uh, he talks about sort of marching on um, marching on one of the busier market days uh, to affect sort of the downtown local economy. A really ingenious way of getting people to think, you know, uh, well, if you're not going to listen to me, then you're going to have to deal with us marching down Main Street every day where you do all of your shopping on Saturday. Uh, if you can't sort of get them to um, listen to your moral arguments about it, maybe make it inconvenient for them, uh, make it uncomfortable for them, um, hit their wallets. The shopkeepers there who are making less money were likely trying to get the politicians to resolve this problem so that their stores uh, would continue to make money and continue to do business. Um, so it's very well thought out uh, planned activity, not just spontaneous um, and not just so, you know, for the heck of it. It is very much planned. It has intentions. And one of those intentions uh, to make people uncomfortable. Um, and that's really what a lot of these nonviolent uh, and direct action campaigns were about was how can we make this community uncomfortable so that they will want to listen to us because if we don't do anything they don't care so we need to give them a reason even if it's perhaps not the best reason you would like them to uh, respect your autonomy and your dignity and all of those things but at the end of the day equality and the right to vote and all of that uh, if you get it because they simply want to avoid seeing you march down main street at least you have that and you can work on the uh, smaller issues of equality um, after that so one of the things that um, MLK is often sort of quoted for uh, is the idea of breaking unjust laws, uh, following some laws and breaking others. So he's asked how he can support breaking some um, while supporting others. Like how, how exactly can you say I support, you know, the, the laws of this country, yet I am going to uh, sit in at this counter where Jim Crow laws say I cannot do it. That seems to be dis disrespecting the law. And he's going to say there are just laws that should be followed and unjust laws that should not be obeyed. So a just law is going to be uh, a just law is a man-made code that squares with moral law or the law of God. Uh, so again, back to his sort of Christian ideology. Any law that uplifts human personality is just and laws that create harmony. So laws in any society are supposed to create that harmony. Um, you know, we don't want people uh, speeding down, um, you know, uh, suburb streets we don't want you doing 65 why because that puts a lot of people in danger slow down it creates a more harmonious society people are safer so laws are supposed to do that when we have laws that create antagonism that is something that we should be going against there's obviously a problem if it's creating uh animosity within the society that is not a good law an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony uh, with the moral law. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. Um, and he's going to say all segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Um, and obviously, if you look at Jim Crow laws, that's exactly what they were meant to do. They were meant to create this sort of superior group and this inferior group group uh, and the inferior group got inferior access to things um, and that is not something that uplifts a community or at least everybody in the community as it should and that is why uh, MLK is going to say that's an unjust law and one that we actually should not follow uh, one that we should actually break until the system realizes how wrong it is and has to fix it uh, so when we run into these unjust laws um, we have no moral uh, obligation to follow them. Uh, they aren't, essentially it's this man-made thing uh, and you don't have to follow it if you have a stronger true moral obligation, um, which MLK feels that he obviously does have a stronger moral obligation than following these Jim Crow segregationist laws. But he's also gonna say you cannot avoid the penalty of the law. Uh, so, when you break the law, even if it is unjust, it is unjust to say that a uh, black person cannot sit at this lunch counter and have a meal. That is absolutely unjust, but by law, it is illegal. 
So when the cops show up and they go to arrest you, you have to accept that penalty. Even if you are adamant that the law is wrong, you can't sort of argue it there. Um, you might hear people say something like, argue it in court, not on the street. Like, don't argue with the police officer, argue it with the court when you get there. This is something sort of similar to that. Not exactly the same thing, but essentially, don't cause, again, a scene that can um, take away from the message that you're trying to send. And at the end of the day, really what's important about this is that you do actually support the justice system, the legal system. You do agree that America needs a legal system. We need laws to create order. But this is an unjust law. But by sort of saying, I will still accept the penalty, you're saying sort of, I accept the authority of the institution, but I don't agree with what is occurring right now. Um, so, you know, it's it's complicated, but it's it really boils down to the idea that MLK does respect our legal system and thinks that you should pay the penalty for things that are illegal under you know the law at that time but then it becomes society's sort of uh you know balls in their court they need to change this if there are detrimental occurrences happening uh such as people being locked up uh for things like eating at a lunch counter um that person can't cause a scene there but as a society when we see that occurring we should be fighting to take those laws away uh and obviously that person should fight it in court they should fight that this is an unjust law um but essentially you know don't run away from the cops and think that you've done something uh successful in moving the movement forward uh you've only given people more fodder um to uh keep uh, keep up with a segregationist uh attitude uh and essentially you've also undermined the legal institution itself and the jobs that cops have to do Often, uh, MLK is sort of accused of causing violence. These protests come, uh, a lot of people show up, and then violence happens to break out. So MLK is definitely going to disagree with what is the cause of this violence. Um, and he'll say, uh, in essence, this sort of attack on him is like blaming somebody for being robbed because they had money in their wallet. Um, we don't blame people for being robbed. We don't say, well, you shouldn't have had money. Uh, you're the victim. You're not the perpetrator. You're not the cause of it. The other person was the perpetrator. You are the victim and should be treated as such. And if you look at sort of this, um, this bottom picture, uh, this is sort of indicative of what he was talking about. Protests would show up, um, you know, angry counter protest mobs of white people would show up, cops would be there, uh, they would have dogs, they'd have water hoses, this violence would sort of break out. But if you look at it in, um, sort of in actuality, there's a lot of nonviolent protesters being attacked and, um, you know, agitated by this crowd trying to provoke a response. And then if anything does happen, it's always blamed on the black protesters as the ones precipitating the violence. But if cops show up with dogs and water hoses and start releasing them on the protesters, who's actually causing the violence? It, it's the cops releasing the dogs. It's the cops using the fire hose. It's not the black you know, peaceful protesters uh, that caused that violence. Uh, just because they were there protesting, you can't say they are the cause of how the uh, cops decided to, or the white community decided to respond to what they were doing. So when we hear about MLK, uh, or at least certainly uh, in uh, when I learned about him, I remember, you know, as a kid, uh, I think there's sort of this idea of MLK as um, sort of this like perfect figure that the entire black community got behind. Uh, and that's really not the case. Uh, there were a lot of people that were not uh, involved or did not like MLK's message. Um, and he points out a couple of those groups. So the, some of the groups that he points out, the apathetic, uh, these would be the black Americans who just didn't care enough to get out and do anything about it. Um, 
so what life sucks so what i'm unequal so what i can't vote uh i just don't care anymore i'm not going to do anything um i'm certainly not going to come to your community organizing i'm not going to come to your protest those aren't going to do anything this is our lot in life uh so he's going to um definitely argue against that point he, he thinks we absolutely can change these things but he's going to point out that there are a lot of black americans who just don't care enough to get involved and uh he's going to sort of try to recruit them into it he's also going to talk about the middle class black americans who aren't getting involved uh, essentially these would be black americans who have made a good enough life for themselves that they don't sort of want to ruin it uh you know maybe they're you know they're middle class they have their house they have their you know managerial job maybe um but what mlk is going to say is you're never going to really be a middle class american you will be a middle class black american and you will always be that unless we start to improve this uh this the racial problems in this country uh no matter how much money you earn you will always be a black person doing that and that's why he still implores sort of middle class and well-to-do families to still join this cause even if they aren't suffering from all of the same things as uh you know inner city uh black americans at the time or something like that uh because regardless of whether they have succeeded in some ways the sort of plight of black americans will follow them regardless uh and then there's the segregation extremists who are on the other side of uh mlk uh who believe that we absolutely should be segregated um, um, and that that was the better way to go. And these were black Americans of the time. So one of the most famous, uh, Malcolm X, was a segregation extremist. He didn't think that white and black communities could ever sort of commingle and be successful. Uh, they had to be successful on their own and separate. And you know he was uh, he had large followings there were lots of people who believed this uh then there are other people um sort of along that camp who are also sort of the violent extremist uh who um would result to would result to violence to solve some of these problems so MLK's nonviolent sort of campaign was not embraced by all black Americans of the time. Uh, and certainly it still isn't. There are still uh, groups of black Americans uh, who feel that nonviolent campaigns and protests are the best way to go. Uh, and there are others who feel that we need to, um, you know, uh, that black Americans need to increase violence, uh, that if, um, you know, I'm just throwing out examples that uh, I've certainly heard in debates. Uh, if the cops are going to be sort of this criminal enterprise that can oppress uh, the black community, then the black community needs to fight back against them. Um, obviously, those aren't necessarily the mainstream or most popular arguments, but there are people who do believe that. And it's important to understand that you can't lump everybody into one category talking about race uh, simply because of their race. You can't say that all black Americans uh, wanted to um, wanted to segregate schools. There were plenty of black Americans who didn't uh, and to this day still do not believe that uh, segre um, desegregating the schools uh, was the best route forward. Uh, so it's important, again, not to classify everybody into that group simply because of their race. So as far as the extremist ideology, uh, MLK was often called an extremist. Um, he is going to disagree with this, but he's going to say, if I am an extremist, I'm an extremist in love. Uh, the segregation extremists are uh, extremists of hate. I am about love and inclusion, and I will be extreme about those messages until we achieve that. So it was sort of his way of playing with the words, um, but also... Uh, you know, avoiding that classification as an extremist, uh, somebody who's crazy, somebody who's just rambling. Like, no, he's a very well thought out intellect and where his passion is coming from are from those Christian ideals that many other Americans, uh, you know, expressed or at least, uh, you know, wanted to express or thought that they should express. So that is why he's going to say if he is an extremist, he's an extremist of love and inclusion. Finally, he's going to end uh, his uh, letter to the clergy, basically calling them out, his disappointment with the white church not acting uh, upon social issues. So a lot of the uh, people that he was writing, the clergy that he was writing, 
would use the defense that the church doesn't get involved in social issues. And MLK is going to say, since when, uh, you know, have you read the gospel? Have you read Jesus's sermons? What are you talking about? It's all about involvement in social issues, in particular, those oppressed and unequal classes, uh, the poor, uh, the oppressed, the prejudiced. Those are the people that Jesus really reached out to. So for church clergy to say that they don't get involved in social issues, uh, MLK is going to say uh, there's no historical precedent for that based on Christianity, and there's no precedent now for you to say that you need to stay out of these things. You've been involved in many social aspects throughout history. It seems that you just don't want to get involved in this particular one because black people are fighting for equality. So he's definitely um, calling out the white church, uh, both their apathy, uh, their arguments against, and then their direct, um, you know, their direct attacks on him and the people uh, involved in these protests for equality. So how he's going to sort of try to reach across the aisle he's going to use faith. They should have this shared principle in common. So instead of saying, you know, you need to do this, like I'm right, this is the reason I'm right, he will say more, are you Christian? You know, so do you believe that all people should be treated fairly? And if they are Christian, they should answer yes. Do you believe that all people are treated equally now? They're, they should answer no. So as he sort of goes down this, basically what he's going to do uh, is use their religion as a jumping off point for why they should join this cause instead of saying you should join it because I want you to. So an example I often use in class is like imagine you're trying to convince a friend to do something with you, um, but maybe they don't want to do it for the same reason. So let's say uh, you want to go to the gym and you want your friend to go. Uh, you go to the gym because you want to be fit. Uh, maybe they like to go to the gym because they get to meet people and talk to people or something like that. If you try to convince your friend to go to the gym because it's healthy for them um, and it, you know, it'll improve all of these things for them uh, health-wise, that might not work, but maybe if, again, you want them on your side, you want them to go to the gym with you, so that's sort of your end goal. Instead, say, you know, oh, I heard, you know, John, Jim, and uh, Annie were down at the gym, like, we should definitely go this afternoon. Uh, that would be an incentive for them. Now they will go to the gym for you, but based on your two sort of different reasons for getting there. But in the end, you both get there. So that's sort of his way of reaching across the aisle and working them up from their own moral foundations instead of his moral foundations. So for your critical thinking task, uh, here's two questions I have for you. Do you believe we have an obligation to defy unjust laws? Um, so this is a little bit more, not just that there are unjust laws, but that we might have an obligation to defy them when we find them. Uh, so something like sitting at a lunch counter, he points to that. That is an unjust law. And he's almost going to say you as a black American have an obligation to defy that law because of how unjust it is. Uh, you need to bring attention to it. We need to change it. So I sort of ask you, are there any unjust laws that you think we should be obligated to defy? And then do you foresee any problems in identifying just from unjust laws? So as MLK is accused, how do you follow some laws? How do you not follow others? Um, do you uh, foresee any problems in people being able to say, no, there's just laws and there's unjust laws? Not that there's just laws. Uh, you know, we have plenty of them. You should follow them all. They're all equal. Um, that's different, again, from saying that there are some that we should absolutely follow and some that we may have an obligation to defy. Are there problems you can foresee with that, such as perhaps people um, having different opinions on which laws are just and which ones are unjust, and then how that might affect moving forward with it or solving the problem? Uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation, and I will see you guys next time.